people in the room already know about speculation on food. It's something people are familiar with. Quite a few already. I was read the other day in the Financial Times um, somebody complaining that uh, anti-capitalist protesters in London knew a lot more about the workings of the market than most uh, British or European politicians. So anyway, hopefully I won't be telling you too much about things you know already. Um, but I can't think of a better place really to talk about food speculation than right here in the city of London because of the way that this movement is its a running challenge to the financial sector but it's also shining a light on the practices of banks and the power of banks. And it's really banks and hedge funds, people who are just a stone's throw from here who are behind speculation on food, which has really got to be you know, the thin end of the wedge when it comes to capitalism pretty raw edge, pretty cut and dried, you know, people are gambling with staple foods and as a direct result, people in the third world can't afford to eat. Pretty, pretty straightforward stuff. So, it's also a good time to talk about food speculation, it's lunch time. I thought I'd bring my sandwich into this talk at this stage, which doesn't look like a financial asset, does it? Really, it doesn't look like it's something that... <laughs> drives money, makes, drives money around the world. But actually, the ingredients in this sandwich, particularly wheat, derivatives based on these ingredients, are um, vast amounts of money are pouring into them. They're called agricultural derivatives, or ags, as they're known, uh, to the people who trade them. Um, and you can now bet on the prices of a dookie beans, a leveraged soya bean. What's a leveraged soya bean? It just sounds wrong. Um, and greasy wool, and also staple foods like maize, which is staple food for you know, half the population of sub-Saharan Africa. Now, these markets have grown massively. In 2002, there was, I think it was 3 billion invested in uh, agricultural commodities. Last year, there was 126 billion. So this, this whole market has exploded. And what's been the impact of that? Well, since all this uh, managed money, took an interest in food, prices have started behaving in two ways. Firstly, they've gone up, the price of food has gone up, and secondly, it started to become massively volatile and swing up and down. So what that means for maize, for example, is that it's tripled um, in the last 10 years. And what this means for the developing world, where households spend around 70% of their income on food, is that people can't afford to eat. And it means that, pe that children stop growing. So, this is a pretty catastrophic impact. And the World Bank, I think their estimate was 70 million people catapulted into uh, poverty and malnutrition as a result of price rises last year. So that's more than the entire population of the UK. So it's massive impact. So how do we get to this point where elites are gambling with their fortunes in such a way that stunts children? Well, it's a name that we've heard a few times already today, Goldman Sachs. Once mm. described by uh, Matt Tabibi in the Rolling Stone as a giant vampire squid ramming its blood funnel <laughs> into anything that smells like money. So they must have smelt bread baking you know, when they came up with the idea for this product called a commodity index fund, which is where the mathematics comes into it as well, as Danny mentioned, you know, some very bright people uh, behind these investment products. So they bundled together a whole load of derivatives commodity derivatives, energy and food, um, turn them into something called an index, which sort of behaved like a stock or share. I'm not going to go too deeply into the economics. It took me quite a while to understand it, but if I try to explain it, we'll be here all day. So you invest money in this thing um, and you, you make money out of it. It tracks the prices of these, um, of these indexes. Um, now, so they created this, this, um, this product then there was the Futures Modernization Act in 2000, which also brought us credit default swaps, which basically opened up these markets to um, big, much bigger financial players. Then you had, yeah. Uh, the Futures Modernization Act, I think that, that was in America, but a lot of the, yeah, depends where they're traded, but that, that particular one was in America. Um, and then there was the, other places where people usually invested their money started to dry up. So you had the dot-com bubble burst, then you had the uh, sub 